What a great song, Hold Me Jesus. And what an appropriate song for what we're going to be talking about today. You know, one of the things I love about um, that song is it, it's an honest song. It talks about how uh, we want Christ in our lives, but we, we continue to fight it. We continue to fight uh, the things that, uh, that there's, there's the line there, um, I continue to fight you um, for what I don't need uh, while you're trying to give me what, what I need. And sometimes we get that confused. Sometimes we see those shiny objects in life and we, we see the things that we just want right then and there. And, and we don't think of the consequences when we realize that God is actually seen all around us. Uh, God is seen the beginning, the middle, the end. Uh, the, every, every ripple effect that we create, whether it's a good one or a bad one, uh, I believe that God is, is aware of that, and sometimes God is uh, whispering in our ear of helping us in the directions that we take. I don't believe that God causes bad things to happen in our lives. I don't believe that God uh, is a, a puppet master or anything like that. Uh, I do believe that God is our advocate, that Christ in our lives is our advocate that walks with us, that cries when we cry, hurts when we hurt, and helps to turn uh, our tragedies into something good, tries to help us to, to recover from things in life. And sometimes we can steer off the path ourselves by making poor choices in our life. Um, let's get back to where we were with uh, our ongoing series of the stories before the New Testament. We have been talking about Joseph, uh, a person in the book of Genesis. Uh, it, we've done two of these so far, so if you have not seen any you would like to go back, uh, please feel free to go to our YouTube page, or if you're listening to this on our podcast, to just click uh, the one of the sermons before that. Uh, they should be numbered Joseph 1, Joseph 2 kind of thing. But uh, to catch up real quick, Joseph was, uh, he was, a, he was mature beyond his years, even though he was a young person. He was reliable, he was responsible, he was faithful, and he had brothers that did not like him because he challenged them. Uh, they, he, they, were, they were not the, the, the same personality types as Joseph. And rather than embracing differences in our world and even in our families, they saw the difference as a threat uh, they, they knew that he didn't think the same way that they do, and he, they wanted to get rid of him. And so they continued to bully him, and they continued to, to, to fester in this hatred for him. They continued to talk uh, badly about him, and so much of that fervor uh, started to, to grow and escalate that it ended tragically with them actually taking their brother and selling him to the Ishmaelites, who were people that were, uh, uh, some of these folks were in the slave trade, and they would go to Egypt and they would sell people in the slave trade. Why anybody would do this uh, to anybody is beyond me, but why somebody would do this to their own brother or their own family member, to just totally outcast somebody like that is quite tragic. And that's what happened with Joseph. Before he uh, realized what was going on, he is in shackles and he is being taken. And his life is changing forever. The challenges in his life are changing forever. And like I say, I don't believe that God uh, said bad things are going to happen to you, Joseph. I'm going to cause this. I do believe that God was with him the entire time. And we're going to learn that Joseph felt that way. Uh, to catch up where Joseph is, we're at Genesis 39, 1 through 23. And verse 1 says, Now Joseph was taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there. Now, this Potiphar, uh, the captain of the guard, this is a high-level person. Uh, this is a, a person of, of great power and, and of great influence. Uh, the, uh, the Pharaoh is above him, but there are very few other people 
that are um, above or equal to him. He has a lot going on in his life. He has, um, lives very comfortably, and he's able to purchase his own servants. We, we like to call them servants now, but they were slaves. Uh, they, they were people that were, were purchased just like Joseph was. And as he took Joseph in, he did notice, like everybody that seems to interact with Joseph, he did understand, he did start to realize that Joseph was somebody special, somebody different, somebody that had great intelligence, great maturity, and he soon realized that Joseph was somebody that could be trusted, that, that Joseph was somebody that he could actually give more responsibilities to. And as time went on, Potiphar gave Joseph pretty much all of the responsibilities of the household. In other words, uh, there was Potiphar and his family, and then there was Joseph, and then there was the rest of the servants and slaves. Joseph was in charge of that household. If Potiphar was the president, Joseph had found himself to be the vice president of that household. And he was treated actually quite well. He was given a lot of responsibilities. But even with great responsibility does, does come uh, temptation to, to throw it all away. Uh, so many times in our lives, we have had something where we have, we have been comfortable, we have been steady, and just one choice, one decision can mess it all up. And Joseph was, found himself where some of the, the things uh, were presenting themselves into his life that he had to make choices about. The Bible says that Joseph, uh, in his age, was a, uh, uh, turned out to be a, a very attractive young man. I have no idea uh, that far back uh, what attractiveness uh, meant, if it meant, uh, I'm going to assume baldness, I'm, I'm going to assume premature baldness. Uh, you know, this just that makes me feel better about myself, but I think that what he was is he, he was considered a, a very attractive man. And Potiphar's wife, Potiphar's wife uh, became attracted to him. And Potiphar's wife, like many people, like Potiphar himself, were people that uh, were in a certain level of uh, comfort. And they were used to the certain level of power that they had. And they were used to, if they wanted something, they could have it. And so Potiphar's wife kept um, flirting with Joseph. And Joseph found himself in a very awkward situation. He found himself uh, at the, uh, when, when they were alone, Potiphar's wife started to um, make advances to him and actually uh, would vocalize a request of uh, asking him to, uh, to join her in, in her bedroom. Um, but Joseph knew that this was not the right thing to do. Have you ever, before you've been able to make a choice, have you ever been able to just determine right off the bat what is right and what is wrong? I think most of us, when we, when we take the time to realize and to think about something, we know that what is right and what is wrong. Now, Joseph was a person that was a slave at this time. His entire life had changed. This short-term pleasure could have been a great escape for him. It could have been something that he uh, knew that he could get away with because she was willing to keep the secret. Uh, she was willing to... to to, um, to, to make sure that it was in the, the cover of darkness as it was, where uh, Potiphar was not there, servants were not around. It was, an easy, it was an easy action to get away with. And sometimes we're faced with those things too, aren't we? Sometimes we are faced with things in our lives where we know that we could easily get away with it, but yet there's something, there's something 
in, a, in, in the back of our head or in our gut that knows that it's wrong. The, the choices that we make should not be uh, measured by whether or not we can get away with it or not. The choices that we make in life should be made to better ourselves and to better the people around us, don't you think? Well, that's what, that's what Joseph thought. And if we look at the scripture, it says, but he refused. And he said to his master's wife, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. And he has put me in charge of all that he owns. There is no one greater in this house than I. And he has withheld nothing from me except you. Because you are his wife. How then? How then could I do this great evil and sin against God? Joseph knew that if he took her up on her offer, he could get away with it. But he knew that the faith in him, he knew that it was wrong. And there's certain things that we do in our lives that we can measure whether or not something is right or whether or not something is wrong. You know, it's so funny, being a pastor, uh, we, we talk about a lot of things, but you'll be surprised how many pastors do not want to talk about a word called sin anymore. Because they think that it makes people uncomfortable. They think that, it, you know, because for so many years people uh, scolded people for uh, being sinful. And a lot of the, the churches talk about, you know, the, the damages of hell and that if you're, you live a sinful life and you must repent and all of this kind of stuff. I'm not here to give us a, a, a fire and brimstone uh, talk here, but I am here to talk about that sin still matters and it's still important for us to avoid it. It's still important for us to be able to walk a life as, as far away from sin as we can. Because sin hurts us. Because sin and the actions that we take harm us. Let's take a look at the definition of sin first. Let's just look at that. Sin, the word actual sin, comes from the Hebrew word shait. And it was an archery term, meaning missing the mark. That's simply what it was. In the times of uh, archery, if someone were to lean back with their bow and arrow, aim for something, and if they missed the bullseye, somebody there, a judge, you know, the referees, whatever you want to call them, would raise their hand and go, sin, meaning you missed the mark. Meaning the thing that you were aiming for you missed. It's important for us to look at sin that way, for me anyway. It's important for me to look at sin as in the, every one of us, we want to hit that bullseye in life. We have our goals. We have the things that we're supposed to be doing in our lives. We have the path that we are all supposed to be on. And every once in a while, maybe more than every once in a while, we choose things or we make choices or we, do, we have actions or behaviors or reactions that take us away from the goal that we had in mind. If, if we had an imaginary uh, judge in our life, an imaginary referee or whatever, every time that we made a poor choice, we could just imagine him raising his hand or her and saying, sin, sin, you're off the, you're off the mark there. It's important for us. Joseph was a person that knew that he had power, that knew that he had a, a, almost a better life than the life that he had before. He was a servant, but he was enjoying the benefits of the new position that he was in because he was put in charge of so many things. And for him, it was not about... I could lose this responsibility. I could lose this cushy job. It was more about how can I do what is wrong? And how can I hurt the person that gave me this position that I'm in? How can I 
harm Potiphar, and how can I, how can I sin against God? You see, some God is not the puppet master. He's not the one that's just pointing his finger and saying, I'm disappointed in you. For God, it's sometimes we can think of God as a guide, as a person that's holding the compass for us, as a person that's saying, this is the way. This is the path. This is the one that's going to help you. Stay true to it. And you know the funny thing about that path is sometimes it has nothing to do with a physical path. It has to do with growth. It has to do with maturity, spiritual maturity. It has to do with our own self becoming a better self. And when we become a better self, we are able to give more to others. We feel better about ourselves. It's the love God Love yourself and love your neighbor. It's the being true to God, growing in that spiritual maturity. It's about loving ourselves and learning to like ourselves because we're not making choices anymore that harm ourselves. And then when we like ourselves, it's easier for us to not see our neighbor as a threat, but to see our neighbor as a friend. And that's what we shoot for. And that's the thing that God is telling us. Stay on this path. And whenever we sin, it takes us off of that path. Let's, let's just take a look at the, the sin that, uh, that Joseph might have done. Let's just take a look at infidelity. There, there's just a few things that you can ask yourself if you pause long enough before you make a decision. The first one is, is this disrespectful? Is the action that I am going to take disrespectful? And that means disrespectful to the people involved, and that also means is it disrespectful to you. If Joseph were to say yes, he would be using, first off, he would be using the wife as an object of short-term pleasure. That's disrespectful. He would be turning away from Potiphar, he would be lying. He would be disrespecting the people around him. And he would not be respecting himself. Is it harmful? What is the long-term gain of something like that? Now, whether or not we get caught with our actions or not, we do know that things settle in us. In other words, when we make poor choices, we have these wonderful gauges that tell us that we've made poor choices, like guilt, like shame. And it does harm us in the long run, whether we, have, uh, we get caught for it or not. We do feel worse about ourselves as time goes on, and we sit on it, and we work to try to rationalize it, and we try to make excuses for it. But in the end game, we feel rotten about ourselves. It is harmful. And the disrespect alone is harmful for the people around us. Whenever we are treating somebody in, in, a, in a place where we are just getting our own sense of satisfaction at the cost of somebody else, at the cost of a friendship, that's harmful. And it's hurting people. And is it missing the mark? If Joseph were to engage in this activity, would it have taken him off the path that his faith was growing in? Would it have taken him off that path? Do the choices that we make daily, do they take us off the path of our own spiritual growth? And one thing I've learned in so many mistakes that I have made and so many times that I have been off the path is that spiritual growth is the most important thing in our lives. Becoming more spiritually mature is the most important thing in our lives because it affects everything that we do from then on. Every person that we uh, talk to, the way that we deal with our neighbor, the way that we treat ourselves 
all has the backbone of spiritual maturity. And if our spiritual maturity is being sacrificed, we don't grow and our actions show that. Let's take a look at, at some other things that we would call uh, sin. Let's take a look at abuse, abuse of any kind. There can be a, a, a physical abuse. There can be sexual abuse. There can be mental abuse. There can be uh, drug abuse. There can be any kind of abuse. The word abuse itself tells us something of whether or not this is a sin or not. And yet, and yet, we continue to do it. We continue to either in, a, in our lives harm others or harm ourselves. Is it disrespectful? Is it harmful? Is it missing the mark? Any type of abuse, the end game is disrespect. No matter if it is uh, somebody that is um, uh, abusing another person or abusing themselves with a, an addiction. You are harming yourself. You are disrespecting yourself. And you are off the mark every single time. What about greed? When we want something, when we want it now, sometimes greed is in the form of, uh, you, you, we picture the, uh, the, the uh, Ebenezer Scrooge character or uh, you know, somebody with, with high finance and all of this kind of stuff. Greed can also just be self-centeredness. It can be thinking about ourselves before we think about our neighbor. It can be talking about just our own satisfaction. If, if uh, the, the action of Joseph, if he were to take uh, uh, the, the uh, offer from the wife, there would be a sense of greed out of it too. I want what I want when I want it. And that is disrespectful to people because in many ways when we are self-centered, we take other people for granted. And sometimes we even take ourselves for granted. And is it harmful? Yes. We know that the long term, you may get all of the physical things you want, but in the, you may lose such a, such a big part of you along the way. So many people that have climbed that ladder of success have lost friends and family and stepped on others. It is harmful. And when we focus on the things and the power and the self-centered satisfaction, we are ignoring any chance of being on the path of spiritual growth. We are off the mark when we give in to greed. Dishonoring a neighbor. This comes in so many forms, folks. So many forms. Dishonoring a neighbor could mean just talking about somebody behind their back. It could mean uh, being uh, one person to their face and being another person behind them. Dishonoring a neighbor uh, could mean um, if we treat the entire world as our neighbor. It could mean just being a prejudiced person against another group of people just because you don't like them. It could be not sitting with somebody and hearing their story before making a judgment of who they are. It could mean trying to keep people out. When the path of God tells us it's about inviting people in. Any time that we turn our back on a neighbor... You know, sometimes disrespect in the neighbor also means inactivity. When you see in, uh, something that is not right, when you see the abuse of somebody else, when you see uh, people that are hurting, your inactivity, your your not wanting to get involved. You're being okay with the status quo even though people are being mistreated. That 
is dishonoring a neighbor. And that takes us off the path. You see, our path is one that we walk uh, as individuals, but it leads us to actions of community. And that's very, very important. That's a very, very important part of our spiritual growth is not only how we treat ourselves, but how we treat our neighbors. And that is everyone. It, me it means helping uh, fight against things like, like greed. It means helping fight against the, the short-term satisfaction when you know that the long-term of that is going to have its consequences. It means welcoming people in. It means loving people as they are. That's what that means. It means accepting people even if they are different than you. It means keeping that door open. But so many times, so many times we go off the mark on that. And dishonoring ourselves so many times we wake up in the morning, we look in the mirror and we think, especially, I mean, especially after what is it, the, what are we calling it, the COVID-19, that people are gaining weight on the, the thing there. We, we, we're looking at our self-image in very poor ways. We, we, we try to do things that change it or we, we, we um, try to go on crash diets or we, we try to uh, exercise more or, or we wish we had uh, different things about us that we can't even change. But we focus on the things that we don't like about ourselves rather than focusing on the things that give us strength, the things that, that, that God loves about us. Every morning we, we might look in that mirror and we might have a very negative thing to say about ourselves. We would call ourselves stupid. We are the worst critics of ourselves than we are of anybody else in the world. And sometimes what that leads us to is just this hate talk this constant hate talk to where we actually accept it, to where in our own heads, in our hearts, we are our own bully. When we try to achieve something, when we try to move forward in life, it's ourselves that is sometimes telling us that we can't, that we're not worthy of it, or we're incapable of achieving something. It's ourselves that tell us that we don't look like somebody else and we should look like somebody else. It's ourselves that are telling us that our uniqueness is a burden. Is that disrespectful? Is that harmful? And does that take us off the mark? You see, sin is something that we really do need to talk about. We need to continue to talk about the poor choices that we make in life because the poor choices that we make in life do have ripple effects and they do have consequences. People get hurt. We get hurt. When we do harmful talk to ourselves, the outcome, the things that the ripple effects that we cause is a negative outlook on other things too. We, we can't love our neighbor as much when we don't love ourselves, when we don't understand that we are telling ourselves, that we bully ourselves, that we put ourselves down. We, we feel so small, we feel so inadequate, so insecure. It's hard for us to see the good in our other people in our other friends. And it does take us off the mark of our spiritual growth and our spiritual maturity. There he is again. Sin. When you look at yourself, when you say, I should be, I'm not, I'm not as good as, I'm to this, I'm not enough of that, Sin. It's a sin. 
And we, we can look at almost anything, any choices that we make in life. We can look at, is it disrespectful? Is it harmful? Is it missing the mark? We can look at all of those three categories there with anything that we choose to do. If only we take the time sometimes before we act, before we react, if we sometimes would just take the time. If we see something on the news that tells us that we're supposed to hate that other person or dislike this or buy this product to feel better about ourselves, if we just took a little bit of time and asked ourselves, is there anything on this, this decision? If I make this decision, is there anything about this that is disrespectful to them, to others, to me? Is it harmful? Will it have a long-term, if this is a short-term feel-good, will it have a long-term where it causes harm to them or to me? And does it take me off the mark of the bullseye in life that I want to hit? Another really, really easy measurement that you can just ask yourself is, is it love? Is the decision that I am making right now in, my, in this, this time, I, I've seen this, or I'm told this, or I'm encouraged by this, or I see this, uh, people talking about this, and they want me to join this, or I don't want to have anything to do with that. Whatever the choice in our lives are, is it love? Is it love? Do the things that we do in our life, is it love? Before you make that decision to either share that post on Facebook or to fight for this cause or to say that about your neighbor or to say that about yourself, ask yourself, is this love? By making this decision, am I loving God? Staying on the mark? Am I loving myself? Am I loving my neighbor? There's a reason that's our, our mission statement. I guess you call it a mission statement. I just call it our purpose. I just call it our, our movement. It is our movement in this life. This is why this church is here, is because we want to put that into our brains. We want to put that into our hearts. Every move that we make, is this loving God? Is this loving myself? Is this loving my neighbor? Can we, can we ask that question before we make that next decision in our lives? Can we be on the mark? instead of going off of it. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, whatever our challenges are in life, whatever our temptations are in life, whatever we run to, however we react, whatever movement we take, let us do one foot in front of the other, on the path that you have laid out for us. Help us to stay true to you. Help us to stay true to ourselves. And help us to love. Help us to love. In Jesus' name, Lord, we pray. Amen. Sometimes our, our, our choice to not sin can still bring us challenges in our lives. And for Joseph, it certainly did. By him saying no, it angered the wife. And she falsely accused him of trying to attack her. And Joseph would find himself accused of a crime he did not commit. And he would find himself placed into a prison. Sometimes, sometimes choosing the right way doesn't just make it the easy way. 
Sometimes it gives us more challenges. And we will find with Joseph that he will, he will face those challenges and he will remain faithful, faithful to God at all costs. That, that is true spiritual maturity. May we grow in that maturity. May we look to better ourselves and in the process, better our community. Love God, love yourself, love your neighbor. Amen.